if I told you that 60 as in 60% of people with severe hypothyroidism were able to reverse their condition in just two months? In the study, they didn't go on medication, they didn't take supplements, they didn't go on extreme diets. They did one simple thing. They tightly regulated their iodine intake. In this video, I'm going to help you know if you need more or less iodine, how to figure out the best amounts for you, and to know how much of a difference this can make. My name is Dr. Alan Christensen. I'm a board-certified naturopathic endocrinologist with 30 years experience treating thyroid disease naturally. So iodine, think about this as a Goldilocks mineral. You don't want too much or too little. Adults with thyroid disease in the modern world are more at risk for too much than too little. And thankfully, most have a really good chance of improving their thyroid function by being more deliberate about their iodine intake. The average intake in the United States has been at a pretty good range overall. But the, are we good? Thank you. Last request for all of these. I just slid the box with bullet points down so there's a little space between it and the heading on top. Can you do that globally on all the headers that you made so they look uniform to the one that I'm showing in the screen show? This prone to thyroid disease can be triggered by intakes that aren't too far away from average. Even if they're above 200 micrograms per day, that can be a problem. And big studies show that between 30 to 40% of some subpopulations based upon age, gender, and ethnicity, they can be at this level. Individuals getting too much, if they've also got the genetics making them prone to thyroid disease, this can be the biggest controllable factor. Now, I want to throw in a lot of nuance here. This isn't a good guy versus bad guy story. Iodine's not the bad guy. We need it. It's essential for life. But thyroid disease is pretty much genetic. You know, if you're an identical twin, and your twin has thyroid disease, your odds of getting it are over 70%. And the genes that vary are the genes that change iodine requirements. Globally, we still have pediatric thyroid disease in about 20 countries due to low iodine intake. This totally happens. Yet in the developed world, iodine excess has become the leading cause of thyroid problems in adults. How much iodine you need is very predictable based upon your body weight. There's not a lot of difference with this, but the tolerance differs, and that's where the genetics come in. The genes that correlate with thyroid disease are those that create differences in iodine tolerance. Basically, humans come in two flavors when it comes to iodine. There's those of us who have the genes being well adapted to being in coastal areas with a more abundant iodine intake or inland areas with a lower intake. And if we've got those inland genetics and we're chronically above that 200 microgram per day intake, that can set the stage for triggering thyroid problems. And the exciting thing we now know is that if we go deliberately lower for a while, that can often reverse many of these problems. And here's the thing, you don't need to eliminate it. You don't have to avoid it. You couldn't do that and you wouldn't want to do that. The trick is just getting to a good window. And so far to date, there's only one thing that's ever been shown to reverse adult thyroid disease. The only thing shown to do that is really careful iodine regulation. No kidding. Low dose naltrexone, autoimmune paleo diets, gluten-free diets, infrared lights. These things all have helped some people. They all have their place. But either at group studies, they were shown not to work a lot or to even be counterproductive. None of them have been shown to reverse thyroid disease in adults. And our evidence for this is so strong. This comes from different lines of query. We know from how thyroid disease forms. We know this from tracking populations over time. And we also know this from clinical trials, looking at people who are given differing amounts of iodine intake. First off, as far as for the mechanisms. So iodine, this is how we make thyroid hormones. It's, you know, the T4 and T3. Four and three are the number of iodine atoms present. They're super powerful atoms. They have a great capacity for making free radicals. That's why they can help the body with energy production. But the dark side of that is those same free radicals, they can cause cellular damage if they're not well controlled. Now, there's two main ways too much iodine hurts the thyroid. One is by just shutting the gland down. The other is by triggering the autoimmune response. As far as shutting the gland down, this really is a more equals less type thing. So imagine in your house, if you've got too much current, a fuse blows and now the lights go out. So too much power can be the same as no power. And it's the exact same thing in your thyroid. This is called the wolf chaikoff effect and it's the source of the iodine paradox. When you're above your iodine needs, 
you blow a fuse, your thyroid stops taking in iodine, no matter how much is there, and it gets shut down. So too much iodine shuts down the thyroid the same way that a deficiency can. And the other way that it can be a factor is via autoimmunity. Now, I mentioned iodine was a big source of generating free radicals. That's a good thing in the right amount, but in too much, that just damages the thyroid cells. It breaks them down. It also triggers the immune system to think that there's bad stuff here, and that starts to cause it to attack the structures of the thyroid. And let's think about this. The main things we measure with thyroid autoimmunity are antibodies against thyroid peroxidase and then antibodies against thyroglobulin. But what are these? Thyroid peroxidase, it's an enzyme, and it activates iodine into the free radical form. Thyroglobulin is a protein, and it stores iodine as long as it can. But when there's too much, it can't store it. And then the immune system can attack this enzyme and protein. So that's kind of the mechanisms behind this. That's the first big line. The second line is our proof from history and over populations. So in 1924, the U.S. started fortifying food with iodine. Not across the board, not mandatory. But in the following decades, the rate of Hashimoto's in adult women went up 26-fold. Not 26%, 26-fold. Doctors were writing scathing editorials left and right about this new disease they hadn't really seen before, and they knew it came on after fortification. Now, it was a good thing for kids getting goiters, and that's really why fortification started. A lot of the young soldiers who would have been enlisted to World War I, they weren't eligible because they had goiters, especially some of the young men around the Great Lakes area. So the goiter rate went down by a lot. That was a win. But the autoimmune thyroid disease in adult women skyrocketed. And since then, we've seen this happen all over the world, over and over and over again. One of the more recent examples was Denmark. They tracked this really well. Starting the year 2000, they started fortifying iodine, targeting just 50 more micrograms per day. And they did it flawlessly, but they saw the same rates of autoimmune thyroid disease, thyroid cancer, and hypothyroidism go up on average of 50% year after year. We've seen this happen in China, Italy, Australia, I mentioned Denmark, Austria, all around the world, every place in which fortification did occur. So this has been a clear pattern when populations change their iodine intake. So that's the other big line from history. Then we've got clinical trials, intentional deliberate interventions. We now have many showing that if people are given a low iodine diet, a good percent of the time they can reverse chronic adult thyroid disease. One of the more dramatic studies took those with Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism, and it did nothing more than have them go on a lower iodine diet. Over the course of two months, 78% of people fully reversed their hypothyroidism. They got totally normal again. And of those who didn't, most at least improved, even though they didn't normalize. Now, I want to say, we can always learn more. And the studies, there, I wish there was more of them. Some were smaller, some were dated, some were from countries with a higher iodine intake. But we can still learn a lot from them because the effects were so dramatic some of those studies looking at those with the worst versions of overt hypothyroidism, they still saw a 60% reversal within a couple months. So most people still got better, even with the most advanced forms of hypothyroidism. That's one reason we can still trust those studies. Now, they were studies in areas with a higher iodine intake, but they looked at the actual intake of those who got better, and most, it was in the same range that we're concerned about here in the modern world. We know that the intake threshold was about 200 micrograms. The more people were above that, the more likely they were to get thyroid disease, and the more likely they were to get better from lowering iodine. And again, we know that 30 to 40% of American adults are in this window. So it's not everyone. But if you're in that window and you've got the genetics for thyroid disease, this can be the biggest controllable factor. All these people did in those studies was lowered iodine and they got better. They didn't improve their sleep, heal their gut, anything. There's a lot of good things they might have done that they didn't do. That's all they did, and it made a big difference. And then last piece of evidence, there have been clinical trials with iodine supplements. So they've taken people and given different doses of iodine supplements and then watched their signs for thyroid autoimmunity. And it's been clear doses as low as 50 micrograms can trigger thyroid antibodies in susceptible individuals. And the higher the dose, the higher the antibodies. We've got real strong evidence from these interventions. 
And then we've got some data from just looking at people and reports that show up from spontaneous events. Sadly, there are popular views pushing for mega dose iodine. There are now published studies of women who were following guidelines written by certain functional medical doctors saying to take mega dose iodine during pregnancy. These women did as they were told to, they took the doses they were told to take, and they had babies with congenital hypothyroidism. So almost no thyroid function, no thyroid development. This can cause lifelong harm. We have many documented cases of extra iodine triggering autoimmune thyroid disease, hyperthyroidism, Graves' disease, hyperthyroid storm, hypothyroidism, and then the sad cases like those babies that I mentioned. We know that the extra amounts are counterproductive. And the other view about megadoses, it's cool to think that a big problem like thyroid disease could be fixed by one simple nutrient. It's a really nice idea. I wish it was that simple. But sadly, it's really just the opposite of the truth. Because of genetic variation, however, not everyone overdoses as easily as others. There's many that can take higher doses or consume more of it, and it does nothing to them. That's totally true. So you'll hear some say, but I took it and it was fine, or it seemed to help. It's true. Not so much that it's needed, but tolerated. There are those who tolerate it more so than others. So towards the idea of being deliberate about your iodine, where is it coming from? Where might you be getting excess from specifically? I call these the sources of invisible iodine. And some are more thought out than others. Every food has some, but some food has a lot, and some food has really erratic amounts. And there are some foods that are otherwise good foods, but they've got enough iodine to be a problem for those prone to thyroid disease. So some of the biggest sources, sea vegetables, things like kelp or wakame or dulse, if you do consume them, they've got whopping amounts. Processed grain products like commercial bread, there's many types of iodized dough conditioners. Some are not even on the label. Egg yolks can be higher in that. Some types of ocean-derived seafood. Iodized salt or non-iodized salt with iodine as a contaminant, like most versions of sea salt or pink Himalayan salt. And then we think, too, about vitamins with iodine ingredients, and then personal care products with iodine ingredients. And it's the total day's intake together that matters. If all those together are above that threshold, then it gets to be a problem. And this is especially relevant for those on thyroid medication because thyroid meds are also a source of iodine. That's the T3 and that's the T4. Those who are taking them are already getting usually the full day's need for iodine. So whatever they're consuming above and beyond their medication is just stacked on top of that, and that can push them over the threshold by which the medicines don't work as well. So what do you do with all this? You know, a logical thought can be, huh, maybe I should test my iodine levels and see if I'm too high. You know, the best thing really is to do an inventory of your intake. And that's what all guidelines recommend. Iodine tests are not perfect. There's a lot of ones that are pretty accurate for populations, but not really for individuals. So there's a free resource called iodineintake.com. I've made that. It just gives you a questionnaire about common foods, amounts and frequencies and other sources. And from that, you can get a really good gauge of how much is coming into your body. Blood tests for iodine are pretty close to worthless. They're simply not tools for iodine status nutritionally. There are other purposes for them. Urinary tests are really good for populations intakes, but they're not good to see about your current intake. Now, if someone is being deliberately low in iodine, urinary iodine to creatinine ratio tests can help you see if you're at a safe target, if you're at a low enough target but they're not helpful tests to see if you would be benefited by going lower or not. So if you're already going low, they can help you see if you're doing it right. The best thing really is just to do an iodine inventory. So how do you do this? How do you regulate it and how do you go lower? You wanna think about this in stages. The first three to six month stage, the target to help reverse thyroid problems is to be somewhere below about 100 micrograms per day. You want your doctor's guidance, and you want to really track thyroid levels closely. So with that, you want to focus on foods that have the smallest amounts, mostly below 10, 20 micrograms per serving. In the Thyroid Reset Diet book, I broke foods down into green light, yellow light, and red light. And if you're doing the green light foods and being aware of other hidden sources, you usually come out at that safe window for resetting thyroid function. 
And some big ones to think about there, some red light foods can be things like kelp or thresher shark or cod, commercial bread, bacon. There's odd things like prune juice that can show up, but there's certain categories that are often much higher than others. And then there's yellow light foods. So once you've gone through the reset and your thyroid is healed, these can be nice foods to add back in the diet and it's great to have for variety. Things like egg yolks or cow's milk, cheese, salmon. During the active reset stage, even these healthy foods can be too much for some people. And the nice thing is there's so many green light foods. There's so many good foods that don't have excess iodine. Pretty much all vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, poultry, meat, spices, freshwater seafood, you won't starve. And <laughs> there's so many good foods available. And the other cool thing, if you are already plant-based or paleo or autoimmune or gluten-free, that's not a problem. It's really easy to work that into it with being a little bit more deliberate. So the idea is you go through a reset stage, three to six months, watch thyroid function, keep a good eye on thyroid levels, especially if you're on medications, watch thyroid autoimmunity, and as things normalize, think about going to that maintenance stage for more dietary variety. You can get the full details of the Thyroid Reset Diet in Amazon or most major bookstores. I'm going to put a free a link to a free download down in the description. You can get the food list and some good starting ideas. And the exciting thing is that it's not extreme. It's not difficult. Pretty much anything you can imagine, there's really good low iodine food options. So this is the iodine story. And it's an exciting thing. It's been a lot of years understanding where it is now and understanding its applications. But the point of it is that most adults with chronic thyroid disease can do way better with simple dietary change. It's not often the change they were trying, and it's not extreme change, but diet can make a huge difference. So what you eat does matter, and the effective change is not always the hardest one. It can be something that's easy, and you can get going on it right away. My name is Dr. Alan Christensen. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. I focus on natural thyroid care I have for 30 years. This is a place you can come to for well-vetted, solid, not hyped, evidence-based solutions and things you probably won't hear elsewhere. If you have questions, put them down below. I'll keep an eye on these and love to do my best to address those and check out the resources in the descriptions. Iodine hurts the thyroid. One is by just shutting the gland down. The other is by triggering the autoimmune response. As far as shutting the gland down, this really is a more equals less type thing. It's totally true. So imagine in your house, if you've got too much current, well, a fuse blows and now the lights go out. So too much power can be the same as no power. And it's the exact same thing in your thyroid. This is called the Wolf-Chaikoff effect and it's the source of the iodine paradox. When you're 